in 2024. Our guy, Denard Span, D Span in the house. What's going on, buddy? How are you? Let's go. He's ready. Let's He's go. ready. The Let's leadoff go. hitter, baby. On the edge of my seat. Yes, he sir. is ready to roll, man. What, what's going on, man? What, what's, what have you been up to? Oh, man, just, you know, family man, living the dream. That's right. Uh, I got three little ones at the house oh, and, uh, you know, never a dull day, man. You know, it's always something. Uh, always one of them, you know, getting into it with the other. And uh, they keep me and my wife on our toes. And um, uh, But uh, aside from that, you know, getting ready for baseball season. Yeah, and we're here, right? It's yeah, the week, it man. We're excited about yeah. it. I know we just had you on last week talking about getting to the end of spring. Yeah. I was thinking about this knowing you were coming in today. We get so amped for opening day, yeah. right? There's 162 regular season games. But for us from the outside, this one feels like it weighs heavier. Oh, yeah. Do players feel that way as well? Most definitely. I mean, opening day is a special day, uh, I think, for every single ball player. Um, no matter, you know, how many years you got in the big leagues, um, whether it's your first opening day or if it's your, you know, your 15th opening day, it's a special day. Um, it's been a special day for everybody that plays the game since Little League. So, um, like you said, it, it's 162 games. So that first one is special. And then there's a huge drop off after game one. I can tell you that. So y'all do <laughs> want that win more than like 160 or 160, maybe not 160, like game 54. Game yeah. one, do you want the win a little bit more? I would say so because, you know, it's just a, a good way to set the tone for the season. Okay. Obviously, you know, the excitement. You know, in the in the ballpark in the city um, is is huge. They've been waiting for you know the, the team to come back to the tribe or come back home, and you know to get off on the right uh, on the right foot um, with everybody. Usually in attendance, there is usually the biggest crowd of the season. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a good feeling, a lot of energy. Um, you know, you got the introductions and and all the you know just all of that that the, the hoopla that that comes with opening day. So um, high energy for sure. We're gonna play one of your highlights from uh, your Rays opening day a couple of years ago, but I want to ask you what's your Favorite memory from your early years, Minnesota Twins opening days. Did anything stick out? Um, oh man, you taking me way back. Way man. back. Yeah, that was a long. That was like thirty years ago, man. <laughs> uh, Two thousand nine. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, it's that's blurry. I I don't remember like anything distinctively other mm -hmm. than just it just being a special moment. You know, um, playing baseball since the age of five, and then um, you know, getting drafted obviously, and spending six years in the minor leagues, and then finally, you know, experiencing that first. Opening day was a special day. It was a dream come true. And that, for me, I think it was like, you know, I'm a big leaguer now. Whenever you start the season and break camp with the team, it's a different feeling than being called up in the middle of the season. Who was your manager? Was it Jim Kelly still then? Or Garden Hire? Garden Hire? Jim Kelly. That's, a, that's the Buffalo Bills quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Kelly. Sorry, Tom <laughs> Kelly. That would have been a hell of a night. <laughs> you walked out and you got the Bills. Damn, oh, Jim. Is that Thurman Thomas? Like, here? Denard's like, this is a football is field. Is that Thurman Thomas hell? with the bar down his face? <laughs> Jim, Jim said, Andre Reed. Andre Reed, you playing third? I had Gary Gaetti and Bruce Smith out here. <laughs> the best part is Tom Kelly. Jay rarely has slips like yeah, that. I I really know, that's like, is he serious right now? Oh, I'm so glad it no, wasn't me for good. once. That's so great. For right. once. Tom Kelly. He, he you didn't have Tom Kelly either. either. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I did not. Nah, he, nah, Ron Gardenhire. Ron Gardenhire. There yes. you go. There you go. You got. I, I knew what you meant. What about Bob Gardenhire? You know him? Uh, no, I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. That's his cousin, right? Yeah, they're related. Oh, it's his cousin. He works at Target. That's what everybody does <laughs> oh, in Minnesota. Man. Go ahead, Zach. Ask another question because um, I don't know what the hell I'm talking so about. Let's get back on the track here. We're excited for the Rays, obviously, yeah. at the Trop specifically. Yeah. Looking back to last year, Jay and I felt like we were trying to figure out who the leader was of this team throughout okay. the season. Okay. And obviously, they had to deal with a lot injuries-wise. You had the Wander Franco situation pop up. Pre-show, we're like, who's going to be the leader this year? Manny Margot was a voice that was loud. He's mm -hmm. no longer with the team. Even Christian Bethencourt at one point we had heard from some of the players was vocal. Yeah, He's no longer with the team. We know Shane McClanahan's banged up. But, like, who do you think is going to be in the clubhouse? Maybe one of the leaders. You can name more than one guy. But, like, who's going to help lead this team, do you think, this season? I mean, the first name and the obvious name that comes to mind is Zach Eflin. Okay. You know, he was that guy for the team last year. Um, you know, you're talking about a ball club that's very young, you mm -hmm. know, even him, like he's not like he is a 10 year veteran, you know, but he does have the most experience, you know, coming from the Philadelphia Phillies, you know, he was in the postseason and uh, he stepped up last year um, was that voice um, for a lot of the, a lot of the younger players, you know, coming up from, from AAA, which, you know, you know, the Rays, they, they use that, that farm system a lot. So, um, you know, just, just the way he is, I think his personality, you know, he, he's very, 
um, easygoing, even even keel type of guy. So um, I thought he did a good job. So I look for look for him to to do the same thing with guys banged up and some guys missing, like you said. Um, Shane McClanahan as well. Even though he's not on the field, he will be around in the clubhouse rehabbing. Um, he's another guy that I think uh, will will do the same thing. But um, yeah, I would say Zach Eflin for sure. What's the biggest difference when it comes to leadership based on young teams versus veteran teams? Is it one of those things where the younger team needs uh, more of a vocal leader from the veteran side where the veterans kind of know, all right, you know what it takes to be good at this level. I, where's the balance from your experience in the clubhouse on, because I think sometimes leadership can be overblown. Like, oh, yeah. they don't have, a team loses five in a row. They don't yeah. have leadership. Like, I just, I think that's low hanging fruit. Sometimes yeah. you just don't play well enough. Yeah. Uh, t- just talk about the different instances of leadership you saw in your experience. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you have a younger ball club that, like, you know, some, you know, they're too, I want to say, too naive. I don't want to use the word dumb, but they're too mm-hmm. dumb to even realize they need a leader. And sometimes that's to their benefit. They go out there and just, you know, let it hang out and they have fun. Um, but I have been on ball clubs as well, where sometimes the younger players do need at least a a veteran presence. You know, not so much a vocal guy, maybe, but somebody that, who has been there, done that, and can lead by example through their actions. Um, just something as simple as the way you prepare, you know, for a game, how you prepare, uh, prepare for that day, um, you know, or, or maybe how you deal with, uh, you know, with 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 the loss or how you deal with failure. So, um, on a veteran ball club, I mean, yeah, like you said, I think it's just, you know, everybody for the most part has been there, done that, and they kind of just, you know, rely on each other, but they hold each other accountable. So, um, I, I don't know, that's a tough question yeah. for me. You know, it's kind of, you kind of need, I think you, yeah, both, both, both young teams and older teams, I think, need somebody that's going to ultimately hold the team accountable. Out of all the guys you played with in your career, who would you say, just get a short list of guys, the best leaders that you played with? Maybe not the best players, Correct. but the, the best leaders. Correct. Um, my Minnesota days, Michael Kadire. Um, he always had a lot of hidden gems, um, words of wisdom. Um, I, I learned so much you know, from, that, from him. Um, at, at times when I was a younger player, I thought he was riding me. You know, but Mm -hmm. he would say certain things and it it didn't click until, you know, three, four years down the road. And I was like, oh, this is what he meant when he said that before. Um, He obviously was a guy who led by example. Um, So I would say, yeah, Minnesota, Washington days, Jason Worth. um, He was a guy that came from the Philadelphia Phillies as well, had won a World Series. um, And, you know, he just was a guy that took everybody under his wing. He tried to, you know, um, you know, make everybody better. Um, he, you know, he would get on you when, when, you know, when he, when he needed to ride you and get on you. Um, but he did it all in fun and and you knew that ultimately he was trying to do that to bring everybody closer and to help the team, you know, win a world series. What about race? Race. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, when I was here, I was that guy. Uh Believe it or not. I was the old guy. Right. And I'm not, you know, a super vocal leader, Mm -hmm. but I, I, I lead by example. You know, I played um, in the big leagues for 11 years, you know, I, I never was a, an all-star, but I was, you know, a good player. I was a, re- a really good player and, um, you know, I was overachiever. So I think when I came in, it was like, look, I'm 35 years old and I'm out working, you know, the 22, 23 mm-hmm. year olds. You know, I'm showing you the blueprint. This is how you play 11 years in the big leagues. You come here every single day, you know, with the game plan, you have preparation, you know, you go to the to the weight room, you know, you get on time to, to do your treatment, um, you look over the scouting reports, and once 7 o'clock comes, you, you know, you have a checklist of things that you need to do in order to put yourself in a position to be successful, and then at 7 o'clock, you know, you, you let the chips, you know, fall wherever they fall, and then you do it all over again tomorrow. Win, lose, or draw, it doesn't matter, it's a new day, come back tomorrow, ready to go, and... That, that's 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 the secret sauce right there. And I'm glad that we actually got to that because I was going to ask you. So you come in, is that a conversation that like the skipper has? Hey, we want you to help lead this team. Do you just like f- come because there are you know yeah. uh, Ahmed Rosario is coming to this yeah. team now. Maybe he can be a new voice this year. Yeah. Like how does that come to fruition to where a guy that isn't on the roster gets to the squad? Obviously, age has something to do with it. You Correct. mentioned being a little bit older. Yeah. But like, how does that? How does that organically happen? To or do you have conversations, or is it just something where you have to be as an individual somebody who wants to take on that role? Well, when I came when I came to the Rays, like there was no formal conversation, but it was evident. You know, you start looking around. I got gray in my beard. <laughs> Everybody else is, you know, uh, very bare faced and and you know wide eyed, and um, it's not something that you know. I, I once again I had a conversation with Kevin Cash or, or Eric Neander, 
it was, you know, I, I just realized that was my job and that was my role. And, um, you know, before you know it, I started realizing guys, you know, gravitating towards me and asking me a lot of questions and paying attention. You start realizing eyes are on, on me. And, um, and, and that's just kind of how it happened. Now, you know, when I got traded to Seattle that same year in 2018, it was a little bit of a different story. Um, when I got there, you know, the manager, Scott Service, like he can't, he would come up to me from time to time and say, I need you to speak up in, in a couple of these meetings. I need you to talk to, you know, to such and such. Um, so he was, you know, more asking me to, to step up and be that leader that everybody else sees that I am. Um, so, I, you know, I, I've seen it happen, you know, innately and I've seen it happen you know, uh, through conversation between manager and player. Interesting. Who are some of the players Seattle like on the come up at, during your time there? Mitch Haniger. Yeah, he was. Uh, you could tell. I could tell he was up and coming. Um, had an unbelievable year. Uh, you talking about a guy that, um, you know, I'm not. It's no surprise that he's had the success that he's yeah. had. Just the way he prepared and um, just the way he attacked the game. Um, I'm trying to think who else was on that team. I mean, we had a a, a pretty pretty older veteran ball club. You know, we had Kyle Seeger and Robinson Cano. Yeah. D. Gordon was on that team. Um, was Felix still there? Felix was on that team mm-hmm. as well. Nice. Um, who was? Uh, what a beast, man. Uh, Heredia. He was on the yeah. Rays. You know, remember, Guillermo. Uh, yeah. Guillermo Heredia. Um, so not not too much, not, not too many young guys, really. Saw the uh, new turf over there at the yeah. Trop. We were checking out pictures and Jay and I know we talked about too, just from our media game days. I always get lost in the sky. I see pop out pop ups coming at me. Yeah. And the the roof being white. I'm like the ball. We were having this conversation at the Vals bar. I was like, the ball disappears. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's in your mid. Oh, yeah. It's weird. Yeah. So just your experience playing at the trop, like how it differs. Yeah. Um and, and then again, thoughts on playing on like a turf and artificial surface versus real grass. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's really in, in uh, anticipation. Um, and the more reps you have, you know, playing inside the roof, you know, you get a, you you really get a knack for, you know, obviously tracking the ball when it's hit off the bat, and kind of, you know, having to use your 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 instincts and um, just just trust it and 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 you know and, and wait for the ball to really to come out of out of the light. So out terrifying. Of the roof. Um, it can be scary. You know, <laughs> early earlier in my career, I, I played in the Metrodome, so it was the same thing. You know, you're dealing oh, with man. the roof during the daytime. Um, you know, the light shining through the roof as well as the lights, too. So, um, I, yeah, er, I remember early in my career with the, with the Twins, I lost a couple of them. Um, and then you just, you know, you kind of, you know, just kind of get over that fear and you learn, hey, I just got to keep my eye on it and, and trust that it's going to be where I saw it. One of the things that really fascinates me that, you know, maybe because I'm a baseball nerd, is <clears throat> first game of a series, seeing the outfielders work, on bounces off the wall, especially at places like the Trap, places like Boston, places like New York. Take us through that with what you're doing. Like, let's say you're playing center field in Boston, yeah. right? And you know that what whatever kind of angle that ball is going to take, how much work do you guys put in? How early do you go? Um, because I think it's pretty cool if you show up early enough to be able to see yeah. the outfielders. That's something that really goes unnoticed. Well, you know, baseball is a game of inches, <clears throat> right? And, you know, oh, yeah. the difference between, you know, safe and out is bang, bang. You know, and usually, you know, when plays, you know, off the wall, guys are on scoring in scoring position or, or maybe scoring from first to home, the difference between, you know, you, you know, a guy being out or safe is is two perfect relay, mm-hmm. two, uh, two, two perfect relay throws. And, and so, you know, a lot of times as an outfielder, our outfield coach would, would take us to these ballparks that, you know, have weird dimensions and you would want to, you know, practice and see, you know, in the game, like if, if the ball hits off of this side of the wall or the padding, um, you want to know where that ball is going to kick to so that once the game, you're in that game situation and the game is sped up now, now you know how to play that and get that ball in as quick as as, as quick as you can to that to that cutoff guy. Last week, after the Jonathan Aranda injury, I threw the C word out there. I was like, this team feels a little cursed right now. Uh-oh. No, you didn't say a little cursed. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm trying to undersell it because I don't want to, you know. He was looking for the voodoo dolls. <laughs> but here's the you thing. Know, what was going on? Baseball players are inherently superstitious, or a lot are, right? Like, superstitions yeah. is, is a common thing. Yeah, we were talking about, about the movie Major League. Like, there's curses in that movie. Like, the curses are Joe also, Boo, yeah. Curses are a big thing. In yeah. Chicago, the Cubs had the Billy Goat curse. Like, it, it's a thing. So, like, so super, where are we going with this? So <laughs> when guys start to get hurt and injuries start to pile up, is there, have you ever seen a clubhouse where you're like, people start to whisper about curses? Do they get superstitious or is injuries kind of a separate subject? 
No, I, I, I've never been in a clubhouse where we're like, oh, man, like this is just isn't our year. Like the season hasn't even started yet. Yeah, we've had a few injuries, but it's just the next man up mentality. Okay. And, you know, look, man, like you play 162 games, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you follow baseball, you know the Yankees obviously don't win it every year. It may look good on paper mm-hmm. to start the season, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's guys in AAA that have been, you know, waiting their entire lives for this opportunity. And so you can't, like, you know, you can't, you don't have time to really think about, all right, you know, this guy's out or whatever. Like, you just say, like, you know what, like, w- w- whoever is healthy and, and on this active roster, that's who we're riding with. And let's go. Let's strap it up. We still got to play the game. And, um, yeah, that's the mindset. I've never thought, all right, all right, now the season's over. Just not, like, not, not, like not a game there's one. no like, spooky like, yeah. areas of the trop that you yeah, avoid. Game one is before or, game yeah, one. Yeah, it's not even until opening day. He's like, oh, it's over. It's <laughs> over right. for us. Maybe I We're was done. just frustrated. We're done. We're like the Cleveland so, Indian uh, fan in, in the outfield. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Banging the drums. He got I, no drumstick. I'm that guy. You're the Cleveland Indian fan. Yes. Now it's Guardians, but by then Cleveland Indian fan without the drums. That's me. Drumstick. That's you. What's the one thing we asked? We had uh, Bucks running back uh, Rashad White in here last week. And uh, Zach brought up a, a great question. I want to ask you this. What's the number one thing that you wish that baseball fans would understand about professional athletes that they don't know? Yeah, one more time. Uh, what, what's the one thing that you think that the regular fans should know that they don't know? Like his answer was, yeah, we're, we're trying Just the best we can. People. Like, sorry about your fantasy team. Like, I can't, yeah. I can't get any more rushing yeah, out to your fantasy to team. We're trying to get hit every single time. Exactly. We're, we never want to strike out. So what is the one thing that people, like, maybe they don't give baseball players enough credit for or, you know, they think they know about the game, but they really don't because they haven't played it? I mean, just how difficult the game is. I yeah. mean, Simple as that. Like, you know, you, you fail 70% of the time, and we, we've all heard that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you if you're successful three out of ten times, you're you're in Hall of Famer. So just put that in perspective, right? You you fail more than, than you are successful, and we got to do this every single day. You know, so sometimes we're not going to be in a good mood. You know what I mean? And, and it's, just a, it's just a grind. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, we're, we're human beings, and, um, you know, uh, we go through ups and downs. We have personal things in our lives that we deal with on an everyday basis, just like everybody else. And um, we're going out there. We have to try to find, find a way to, you know, the best ones compartmentalize those things and, you know, are able to block it out once, uh, you know, 7 o'clock happens. But, you know, it's, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're human beings and, and we're just like, you know, everybody else, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think those relationships, too. And I, I see it with hockey, spending so much time with the lighting. But baseball's... It's different because different it's grind. day after day different after grind. day. And I'm not asking you to go into anything specific, but like, you know, when, you know, a guy has a problem with his girlfriend or his wife and not anything like yeah, you know, yeah. legally, but just like one of those things, like, you you know, when the guy's going through a rough patch emotionally, like yeah. there's no hiding from it. You're there yeah. day in, day out. Yeah. You, you have to strap it up and you have to find a way to be professional. And that's what makes it difficult. I think baseball, um, other than every other sports, like you can't hide, like, you have to, you know, be at your locker. You have to be ready to go every single day. Like you're, you're asked to, to perform and entertain day in and day out. And um, it's not for the weak minded. You know, you no. have to be strong mentally more so than you know a better athlete, in my opinion, to play at the major league level. All right, good stuff there with Denard's fan. We got a couple more segments to go. When we come back, we'll ask Denard about the AL East hierarchy. Where does he think the Rays fall in there? Yankees, Blue Jays, Orioles. And the Rays take the lead. Oh, that's what a great awesome. highlight that is. Zach, Zach Blobner, Bums. Jay Retcher, Denard Spann. Denard, what's it like to hear that highlight, man? Oh, man. Every time I, I hear that, I get goosebumps. Um, you know, I, I got to lead you up to, you know, set the stage for that for that day. Um, I got traded during the offseason. I was with the San Francisco Giants uh, the year before and got traded for, you know, Evan Longoria. Um, Christian Arroyo was in that trade. And um, I, I get the phone call. And the, f- the first conversation I have with the Rays is we respect you. We love you. But, you know, you're a hometown guy. But, we're you know, we're trying to, if we can, we want to try to trade you. Really? I- Damn. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, you know, this is, I'm thinking this is a homecoming. This is something that I've always dreamed of, of doing is playing for my hometown team. And um, so, you know, I-, I go through that, that entire offseason uncertainty of whether or not I'm going to, or where I'm going to be, what's going to happen. Um, obviously, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't find a trade partner for me. 
And so I, I show up to spring training still with that hanging over me, not knowing. That was the year, um, I think, uh, they traded Odorizzi. Mm-hmm. Corey Dickerson got um, DFA'd mm-hmm. or non-tendered or whatever. I, um, that 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 spring training, and I, you know, I'm just sitting there like I don't know what's going to happen, you know. And you know, I, I find a way to to get through spring training, and um, I get the opening day start. And you know, I, I, earlier in that game, I think it was the first or second inning, I was in left field. You're talking about balls in the lights. Yeah, I lost one in the lights. <sighs> Me and Kiermaier kind of collide. Oh man! Inside the park home run, and this is like the first or second inning of the game, and I'm just like, this is my first game in my home city. I didn't think I was going to be here today, and now here I am screwing <laughs> up the game <laughs> in my hometown. And so here we you go. You ruined it. I know, man. And so, you know, set the stage for the eighth thing, and that situation comes up. And, um, yeah, I hit that. I, I, you know, I, I put a good swing on a, on a tough pitch. I was along at bat, and um, it, it was, you know, I, I couldn't have scripted it more. Like, I feel like my whole life, like, flashed before my eyes just – you know, being a kid growing up here in this city and um, my entire career, the the ups and downs, the obstacles that I had to overcome, um, and then, you know, it landing me to where I am now. I'm standing on third base, just had the game-winning hit, and uh, full circle, my mom's in the stands, my brother's in the stands, family, friends, colleagues are there, and it was just the best feeling ever. Yeah, it was uh – that was just such Magical an iconic moment. Man. Really, I don't think this is hyperbole. I think that that's one of the more iconic moments in the history of Tampa Bay sports, especially ones that like aren't like affiliated with championships, right? Like people always remember. Yeah. Any race fan remembers Denard Span opening, opening day. day. When they and, think of me in the Rays uniform, that's usually the first yeah, thing I hear. Because it was a short lived Rays. It's not a know, bad stint, thing though, man. But, and who'd you got better than remember not re- remembering the run in with Kiermaier, though? Yeah, like nobody. Everybody when you said forgot that, about that. Everybody forgot. I don't about even that. remember that. That's Correct. right. Correct. That's what would you, what's up? What would you say are your like most iconic moments of your career? That's definitely one of them, that's right? One of them. Um, getting a thousand hits. Yep. Um, a career thousand hit. Um, um, and in Washington in 2014, at the end of the season, you know, I had a really good season, hit over 300. You know, I broke the the team record in hits, and um, it was the last game of the season. I got a curtain call, or no, not. Uh, well, I got I got something. I hit. I ended the season with a double. Matt Williams, the manager, took me out the game, and the entire stadium wow was was on their feet, and they gave me a round of applause. Um, so that like, and one of my high school coaches was there in attendance. And he told me he literally shed a tear oh. because he could not believe the love that I was getting, you know, from, you know, these fans. And so, you know, 40, 50,000 people, you know, just applauding me for all of the, you know, the, the hard work that I had had put in that entire season. So that that that's up there. And um, another one, my, my first year in, in Washington, um, you know, I, I struggled the first half of the season. Second half of the season, I was able to, you know, go on a um, a pretty good run. I had a 29 game hit streak, and um, you you know, you, yeah, you, when you get, I got to about 20 games, you're talking about like starting to feel the pressure mm-hmm. and the stress, and um, but I just remember my teammates just, you know, being there with me, hanging in there with me, and then the day I, that that it came to an end, you know, I did a, a post game interview, of course, talking about it, and that's you know the first time I like really you mm-hmm. know felt comfortable talking about it. Um, but then I got in the clubhouse and like everybody, once again, my whole team was standing there. Nobody had gotten undressed. You know, you're talking 10 minutes after the game. Yeah. Normally you do a post game interview. Everybody's in the shower and they're, you know, they're trying to get out of there. Um, the entire team was, you know, waiting for me and they gave me, you know, just a round of applause and, and dap me up. So um, those, you know, those moments right now off the top of my head stick out. Sports. They're, yeah. they're just special in that way. Don't forget to join WDAE Thursday. We're going to broadcast live from the Trop. From sunrise to first pitch for opening day in Tampa Bay, presented by Central Florida Behavioral Health Network and the Department of Children and Families in the radio home of Tampa Bay Rays Baseball right here, 95.3 WDAE and AM620. Want to get your thoughts on the AL East. Obviously, it's stacked. We talk about it yeah. nonstop. Uh, the Yankees add Soto. Yeah. Baltimore adds Burns. And uh, Boston can always spend the Blue Jays, obviously, I don't know if we can say add Votto the same way I just mentioned Soto and Burns, but he's a good addition for them. How do you kind of see the ALE sh- shaking out? Like your just thoughts on the overall division and, and some of the teams? Um, I mean, Boston, I don't think they made any improvements really, right? Like, no, they, they got, got uh, Giolito, right? And then he got, he hurt, got hurt. He got hurt. So, so, like, they, they traded Sale to Atlanta. He's yeah, they gone. don't have any pitching. So they got I, Von, and they got Von Grissom. I think he could be a good player, but they're just... 
they, they got, got that it. Netflix documentary coming out, so that's good for them. Yeah, yeah. they got big that's beans. Good for a couple wins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we I'm all sorry, agree I that we don't have to worry that. about Boston. Listen, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, but I'll say it. We okay. don't have to worry about Boston. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You know me. I we can't even. I, if I say that word, that yeah. six letter word that starts with B and then throw with, up. No, I mean, I've got Steph's girls trained. They, uh, I'll say it, and they'll go, "Ew, Jay, don't say that word in this house." I was like, "I'm so proud." So the other so three proud. teams, then you did your job as a, I did, man. That's dad, it. Right? There you go. So Baltimore, New York, and Toronto are yeah. expected to be all. Pretty good this year. Correct, correct. Uh, Baltimore won the division last year. Obviously, yeah. what are your thoughts? I mean, I look for Baltimore obviously to mm -hmm. to you know mirror some of what they did last year. I mean, they're a year older. They were, that was a young ball club. I think nobody was expecting them to come on the scene the way they did last year. Probably a year or two early. Um, so you know, then you add Burns. You know, that probably the starting pitching. I think last year for them probably was their kind of mm -hmm. weak link, mm -hmm. but they still found ways to you know play tight games and get it to the back end of that bullpen. Um, so now you add burn. So that, that obviously, you know, makes them a lot better. Um, in New York, I mean, I, I don't know, man. Like, it seems like you're talking about cursed, right? I just don't, I, I just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bought in. Even though, even yeah. with the addition to Soto and, and some of the big guys, obviously it, it hangs on if they can stay healthy. Um, but I, I, I still, you know, if I'm a betting man, I'm still putting my money on, on Baltimore and, and Tampa Bay. Okay. Um, you know, Tampa Bay, you know, made a lot of changes. They look, you know, totally different, but you know, every time, you know, you, you feel like you count them yeah. out and be like, hey, it doesn't look that good on paper. That's when, you know, they, you know, shock the world and, and do what they've done for the last five years. Yeah. It's funny with the Yankees, right? Like I like their moves. But I don't necessarily believe their culture's right. Yeah. So they brought in a guy right last here. year in Isaiah Kiner Falefa, who was a guy that can, or two years ago, and he's a jack of all <laughs> trades. He can do a lot of different things. And they had him starting at shortstop. And I'm like, that's that doesn't make sense. He's yeah. a super you guy. Yeah. Uh, I like bringing guys like Trent Grisham, great glove. Yeah. You know, Verdugo, I think, is an under the radar. Yeah. And let's, we talk about Boston. I mean, he traded. Alex Verdugo. To your, I mean, that guy's to got rival. swag to him, right? You, to yeah. your rival. I don't know, man. So now, after not having much power or anything from the left side, the Yankees go out and get, what, well, three guys, and then you get Rizzo back. I think that helps them. Yeah. But there's just something funky going yeah. on with their, you know, with Garrett Cole. Oh, he's you know, out. He's going to be out. Who, what's their starting rotation? Stroman and, and Cortez. And it's what's just the other lefty that they, they spent a lot of money on last offseason? Oh, Carlos season. Rodon. Is he yeah. healthy? And now they're talking. Yeah, I mean... Who knows? And now it looks like they're in on Jordan Montgomery. I, I thought that the Red Sox should go in on Montgomery after losing Giolito. You got money. Why Why didn't you try to go get Stella Montgomery? To me, that shows that they know where they stack up that's in the what I, That's what I, what I was going to say. Like, yeah. what, what, you know, they, they know they don't have a chance to compete, so why go out and spend? Yeah, why do that? Who? And I want to ask you this because I, well, I saw you one time at City Field, Mets, Twins, uh, before the game, we got a chance to talk. And, and one thing that I remember about that batting practice was Jim Tomey would stand there with his legs farther than he would usually, and he would, without oh. even using his legs, just throw the barrel of the bat at the ball and hit the ball off the fence to dead center field. I mean, he was like a freaking I remember that. Yeah, lumberjack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he was a monster. <laughs> yeah. When you think raw power, yeah. the guys you played with or played against, he's got to be on the list. Who else is on that list? Justin Morneau's right there. You got Bryce Harper I played with. Um, CJ Crone. Yeah. With, with Tampa Bay, light tower power. Um, Nelson Cruz I played with. You're talking about a guy that, you know, once he impacts the ball, the ball, like, disappears and it gets real small really quickly. Um, those, oh yeah, those are, yeah. But Jim Tomey, for sure, he's he's up there just as far man. as just just country strong, man. <laughs> just, you know, doesn't lift the weight, but you could tell, you know, I don't know where he came from, but he was on the farm somewhere. Chopping things yeah. with an axe and whatnot. For sure. Another guy that has a pretty sick swing, Shohei Otani. And, and yeah. got to get your thoughts. Obviously, it's the biggest story in baseball yeah. right now. I know the commissioner's not thrilled to be dealing with this, you know, days before opening yeah. day, coming off the Korea series as well. Yeah. Just uh, your thoughts on on how gambling is and in sports. It's a, it's legal now. It's yeah. a part of the world, the culture. Uh, but now, obviously, it's it's leading to some other issues and none bigger than what Otani has right now on his plate in the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, would you clarify? You know, I, obviously, I, I heard what happened, but I don't know full details. So without knowing that, it's hard for me to speak on. Obviously, I know 
you know, something with his interpreter. Mm -hmm. Who was fired because his interpreter was basically gambling, got into a big gambling yeah, debt. Yeah. And then, you know, Tani had put out a statement yesterday, sat down with the media and said that. Yeah, I missed that. I didn't hear. Yeah, I didn't see Said that. that the interpreter stole his money okay, to pay off that. the gambling debt. Yeah, yeah. Like that's, I think that's the smallest but when it conflicting, part. Of but when it conflicting stories, it came out one thing and then now they, the switcheroo of stories. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like you don't know what to believe. But you're also in translation. So, so I will give... Uh, not necessarily the benefit of the doubt, but I'll point out that like they're translating everything for Otani, right? Yeah. So the original statement put out through a different translator was that Otani paid money to help cover the debt, but they've since walked that back and, and said, said that stole them, it was a theft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe not obviously because we don't, uh, none of us yeah. really know, but just about like how gambling it, yeah. it is finding its way into sports and, and what it could mean for for Major League Baseball. I mean, do you think do you think it's going to lead to more problems? Yeah, it's hard to say that. I mean, obviously, this is a, an unfortunate situation. Um, bad, it's a bad look for the game of baseball with its biggest star, um, you know, just being, you know, in the in the media over something that is not positive, especially leading up to the season. Um, he's the biggest name of the, you know, uh, in sports, arguably, right? Like worldwide, mm -hmm. if you look at it from that standpoint. Um, you know, just unfortunate because, like you said, it, it betting and and. And baseball and just sports in general, it, it's 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 all around us. It's all around everybody. It's, it's almost become like you know normalized, and um, so it, it's you know it's something that you know the, the people that are in power might need to rethink and and try to um, re you know I don't know re, you know reconstruct you know how betting and and how it's tied to you know to these major sports um, you know uh, leagues. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I think it's just open Pandora's box and. Yeah. There's going to be more situations. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be more stories coming out like this. All right, one more segment to go with Denard on the other side. Uh, we'll ask him, and we're going to, what are we going to call this now? Spanning the Did globe? we decide on what? Spanning the we, country? We came up with a bunch of names to play off of your name. Yeah. Span, the span Spanning cycle? Spanning sports with Denard. Span, the span cycle? Span, span cycle. The span cycle? Spanning the cycle. We'll figure it out. It's a, wor it's a whip. It's There's a, work a lot of, of good options because span fits in a lot of Maybe we'll just puns. let him pick it because it's his name. But we'll, we'll do have that. it figured out in the break. Yeah, that's right. Four <laughs> quick fire questions for Denard when we come back. But Get first, it together, guys. First, we're, we're working on it. We're working. To go with our guy, Denard. Span and uh, what are we calling it? The spin cycle? The span cycle. The span cycle. All right. Four rapid fire questions. Uh, Zach will start it. And uh, yeah. You don't have to just give one or two word answer. Just a quick response, okay. quick reply. All right, you okay. ready? Let's go. Go ahead, Zach. New places, new faces. You got Soto in New York. You got Otani with the Dodgers. Who has a better hitting year? Soto. Easily. Your favorite stadium to visit when you were a road player? Uh, Yankee Stadium. History, right? Yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. I played. I played an old one. Oh, the last nice. year. Oh uh, man, you're talking about like just goosebumps and just just the feeling of being in that stadium, knowing that. All of the greats played there, and I watched mm -hmm. all you know a lot of great games as a kid. It was a uh, just a surreal moment being there. Sound came from the ground, which was the crazy. I'd never seen anything like that. You looked down because you thought the ground the sound came from the ground. Weirdest superstition can be yours, can be yeah. a teammate's, can be one you heard about. You didn't yeah. even necessarily have to see it. Yeah, Justin Morneau um, had to be out on the field before the game at six forty two. <laughs> we would be in the dugout mid conversation. It's six <laughs> six forty one. That's it. Uh, did I say six fifty two or six forty two? Forty two. Six forty two. It's six forty one. We're in a, we're in a dugout, full conversation, like. He, mid sentence, he just leaves at six forty two and just goes and stretches. So I'm like, okay, I guess it's time to go play ball now. Was there Love an alarm that. that went off, or did no, he, he, just he always he had, had one eye on it. He always had That's one crazy. eye on it, and you could kind of tell, like, if, you, if my back was against, you know, wait, uh, to the clock or whatever, I could tell because he would like once again he would start to look behind <laughs> me, and I'm like, yeah, we're getting close to six forty two, guys. All right, last one, toughest at bat in the bigs. Toughest at bat, um, man, that's a tough one, man. Um, Araldis Chapman, CC Sabathia, uh, Felix Hernandez, Roy Holiday. You hear that Holiday? Because every nothing straight, mm -hmm. everything, right? cutting, it, everything's cutting, dicing. everything is sinking, and it's to both sides of the plate. He can, you know, throw every single pitch wherever he wants. It. And then Araldis because it He's could be one hundred five at your neck, and, and then, then he throws a ninety eight mile hour slider too. So how come we can't hit that, yeah. man? Denard, it's been a lot of fun, man. We are looking forward to our uh, visits with you every Tuesday, and uh, great job, man. Uh, can't wait to see you. you. When can people see you again? Uh, doing Ray stuff, doing yeah. twin stuff as correct, well. Correct, correct. Uh, yeah, so my my first series um, is April, I believe, seventeenth when 
the Rays go play the Yankees on the road, and then uh, Minnesota mid-May as well. So looking forward to that. Exciting times. Um, baseball is back, baby. You got that Baseball's right. Baseball's back. Appreciate Let's you, go. buddy. Thank you. No problem. All right. Next week, we will have Denard again at 1 o'clock here on Tuesday. When we come